Hi folks, Thomas Henson here with thomashenson.com and today is another episode of Big Data, Big Questions. And so today's question comes in, I want to talk more about IoT, right? like I was talking about in the last few videos on IoT. This is something huge, this is something I think that a lot of data engineers should really start digging into. These are going to be workloads that we're going to see and even modern application developers, maybe you don't do big data, you're going to be impacted by this. I want to talk about message brokers and IoT. So I want to talk about, you know, what what a message broker is, how that architecture works, and then also like some of the major players in there. And you've probably heard of a few of these, but find out more right after this. So welcome back. Thanks for tuning in. So today we're going to dig into message brokers and IoT. And so really want to talk about you know, how message brokers work in IoT and how really the data push, because it's a little bit different, right? It's not your traditional application. So, you know, in IoT, you know, your devices are out there with IP connections. It may have a spotty connection, but how do you ensure that you can bring the data back in? And so this is where we start to see message brokers being used. So message brokers are the middleware that's in distributed applications. And so it's really like a queuing system. So it's gonna handle the message validation, transformation, and the routing of the messages. So it, it, it allows for you to move in. So think about, you know, if you have a Raspberry Pi set up for your garage. And so every time your garage door is open, you send a message out, you know, and it sits in a queue to your message broker where you can know that, hey, you know, that garage door now, you know, it was, it was in an open state, but now it's in a closed state or vice versa, right? So then if it's in an open state, maybe that I've got, you know, I've got a message, I've got somebody that subscribed to it to turn my air down because chances are if my garage door is open, it means that I'm going to be home or I'm just pulling in. So I want you to go ahead and kick that air down for me. And so the architecture behind these message brokers is normally going to be a published subscribe. So, you know, this gives you the ability to, you know, your IoT devices, they're going to publish updates. And like I said, they may have a spotty connection. So this is important for them to be able to send those out. So, you know, it's not, it's constantly not sending out a, I'm open, I'm open, I'm open. It's going to send it out whenever that's changed, right? And whenever it has a connection to change. So if you don't have a connection, for your garage door opener, right? If you if if it if the if it changes from open to closed, it's still in that in that message broker. It's still going to be shown as being closed. And so once it you know once that connection hits back up, it's going to change it to be open. So this gives you the ability to one you know work work with non persistent data, right? Work in locations where you're not going to have such a great connection. But this is also going to give you the ability to you know, have multiple subscribers. So you can have multiple subscribers. So I talked about, you know, the air conditioner working, but what about other applications? You know, what if, you know, what if I wanted to have certain lights that came on? What if I wanted to have multiple different um, subscribers or different applications or different I other IoT devices that are looking and keying off of what happens to that garage door from that Raspberry Pi? And so that's just a little bit about that publish subscribe pattern. Probably do another video digging a little bit deeper, maybe maybe throw up some slides on it. But I did want to talk a little bit about um, what some of the uh, message brokers in IoT are. So the first one I want to talk about is Apache Kafka. So Kafka, you know, was incubated and developed outside of uh, LinkedIn. So they were, you know, looking for ways that they could, you know, be able to take in all these messages and have them in a queuing system. And we think about what they were doing. I mean, we're talking about millions, millions and millions of messages, right? And so for many years, it was, you know, used in their production. You see it a lot used in streaming analytics. So, you know, you've heard me talk about Kafka in the Lambda architecture and being able to, you know, support that streaming streaming analytics and have that queuing system. So as those messages come in, you just don't have time for them to hit HDFS right then. So that gives you the ability. Another one is Provega. So Provega is open source out of Dell EMC. Heard me talk about it when we talk about the Kappa architecture. So this gives you the ability to have that messaging queue for those devices as they come in. They're sitting in that queue system, but because it's part of the Kappa architecture, even your batch rights and your streaming rights can all be accessed through Provega versus, you know, typically when we talk about a Lambda architecture, we have our, you know, think about, you know, our batch layer. So we have our batch layer, traditionally probably going to be in HDFS. Then you have your streaming layer that might be in Kafka or, you know, Spark Streaming or some, some of the other, some of the applications. And then you have two different code bases to be able to do that. And so Provega built from the ground up for streaming architecture but also giving you that ability to really take advantage of the Kappa architecture and be able to have one code base 
to be able to use and be able to access and write your, uh, you know, whether it be Spark jobs or whether it be old map produce jobs, those types of things. And then the third one that I wanted to talk about was RabbitMQ. So another message broker in IoT is uh, RabbitMQ. So widely developed for web development. So, you know, it was, you know, originally developed for, you know, web services to be able to respond to a call request. And so if you think about and you look at a lot of the frameworks that it supports and a lot of the code levels, we're talking still, you know, Ruby, PHP, .NET, you know, a lot of the uh, development stack, even a lot of JavaScript. I've seen some people who have some courses out there on RabbitMQ just for the JavaScript uh, developer. And so it's another one that's kind of a message queuing system built, you know, built, built to be able to, you know, stream, built to be out for streaming analytics and be able to distribute those messages. Still not seen or as popular as Kafka as far as when we start talking about big data analytics, but you're starting to see a little movement from that area. And then also there are, there are other ones out there with uh, the, you know, Azure having one and uh, AWS IoT, they use a publish subscribe um, in their architecture for their IoT uh, platform. So there's a lot of different ways to use those message brokers. I think this is a concept that you really should, you know, be familiar with to some extent because you're probably already using one. You maybe just haven't referred to it as a message broker. So that's all I have for today. Make sure you subscribe uh, to the YouTube channel here. You never want to miss an episode. And this gives you an opportunity to, you know, ask questions, you know, submit them down here in the comment section below, but always stay tuned. Make sure you know, to keep your big data, data engineering knowledge on point. Thanks again.